Welcome to another exciting edition of Canon's Africa Frontiers of Innovation. My name is Victoria Rubadiri, and I'll be moderating this session. Well, this is a thought leadership talk series that's been spearheaded by Canon. Africans aged between 15 to 35 years are the majority on the continent, and we know this. And this youth population is projected to double by 2050. So the need to innovate and find sustainable ways to support youth employment cannot be overstated. Well, Africa has a huge opportunity to capitalize on its youth and what it does today in building necessary skills among the youth will propel it into the fourth industrial revolution and shape its own destiny. And that's what we're talking about today in this discussion that really comes off the back of World Youth Skills Day. This year's theme is transforming youth skills for the future. And that's essentially what will guide this session. If you have any questions, by the way, you can place them in the comment section of the Canon EMEA LinkedIn page or Canon CNA Facebook page. And we'll be sure to get them to our panelists who I'm about to introduce. Our first panelist is Liz Ntonjira, and she is a policy communication specialist and author based in Nairobi, Kenya. She is the go-to when it comes to strategic communications, media advocacy, and policy facilitation with extensive experience gained with several roles that she has played in the public, private, and international development sectors spanning over 16 years. Well, Liz is currently the Global Communication Director at AMREF Health Africa, where she leads and mentors a capable communications team. Now, in August of 2020, that's right, during the pandemic year, Liz self-published and released her first book about youth and leadership titled Hashtag Youth Can. It is an anthology of powerful, inspiring, and challenging stories from youth, breaking barriers across 22 African countries. Well, she also runs the Liz Ntonjira Network, a platform that provides innovative, engaging, interactive, and tailored training and coaching for the youth. And she'll be telling us more about that initiative. We also have Dr. Babangida Ruma, and he is the founder of Digital Skills Bank and a global youth advocate. He is a visionary youth leader who has a passion for digital innovation and technology. He has worked with leaders around the world to empower young people and promote peace and harmony and was appointed as a global ambassador for the Commonwealth Youth Council. Dr. Ruma is also the only Nigerian nominated for an Africa Youth Award for his contribution to human capital development. Thank you both for joining me. Um, uh, let's get into the discussion. And I think I really want to paint a picture of where we are now. And that's really off of the back of a global crisis, a public health crisis, uh, which I'm talking about the COVID-19 pandemic and how much of an impact that was on the youth. Uh, when you think about job loss, that was across the board for everyone, but youth seemed to be disproportionately affected by this uh, when it came to different sectors. Many of them were found themselves in temporary or fixed term contracts. And oftentimes those were the first people to go during job cuts. And you couple that with the existing crisis on the African continent, which is youth unemployment. Um, and, and so when you look at that state of affairs for the youth, what do you say about pulling them out of that? And I just want to kind of get your initial reactions to the pandemic with the current state of affairs of youth on the continent. So um, Liz, let me begin with you and then we'll come to you, Dr. Ruma. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Vicky, for having me here. And nice to meet you and have this conversation and discussion, Dr. Ruma. Uh, without a doubt, you know, the pandemic um, really did affect young people across the continent. And let's not forget um, that we're not just talking about the fixed term contracts, we're talking also about the small businesses. We know young people in Africa are very creative. They're a powerhouse in terms of the jobs that are maybe not even registered in the local authorities in terms of the creative industry. We saw, um, we 
a lot of countries imposing curfews. Um, one of the biggest areas where young people were employed was in entertainment um, uh, places. Like we have our DJs, we have our dancers, um, we have different people who are performing arts in theaters. And there was a moment where people could, a, a long period of time where people were not allowed to come out of their houses. And in some countries like South Africa, you'd have to ask for permission from authorities to actually even go get some needed utilities. So it really did exacerbate the issue of job losses um, and unemployment in Africa. And let's not also forget children. Um, the fact that children were not going to school, we saw the digital divide that actually exists. I know a lot of us talk about the internet penetration. Uh, more people have access to smartphones. More people um, use their mobile phones for different activities. But let's not forget a lot of children were not able to go to school. On, on the health frontier, young people were affected in terms of we had an increase in teenage pregnancies as witnessed in Kenya, Uganda, parts of Tanzania, and even Ethiopia, we saw a lot of conflict. We saw also a lot of issues to do with mental health um, being affected. We did see during that pandemic period, a lot of people that we know, and, and you know, one of the things that a lot of people don't talk about is high performing depress depression, where we had some celebrities actually commit suicide. So mental health also came to the fore. So this was among the many issues that affected young people. Um, it's quite unfortunate that different African governments took a long time to react to this or to cushion members of the public uh, or their citizens against this, especially the most vulnerable women, children, and the youth. Um, but I have to give um, to take cognizance and acknowledge that some governments did come in to play a role in terms of tax cuts, in terms of subsidies that they imposed. But I think for me, the biggest and best example is Rwanda. Uh, Rwanda have this um, development fund called the Aguchiro. The Aguchiro fund really came in handy during the pandemic. And if you recall, it was founded during the time in the 1990s when you know, uh, donor, don the donor landscape was changing and no more donor funding was coming or it was coming with conditions. And one of the things that the president Paul Kagame did is say, you know what? We need Rwandans to stand up for Rwandans. How can we also fundraise for our own people and not rely on donor aid? And the Aguchiro Fund does this. And during that period, we saw the essence of having some funding set aside by government to cushion vulnerable people. This is the fund that was used to get food and utilities to the most vulnerable in the rural areas. This fund also helped people with loans that were not able to pay back to their bank. So you can imagine when these things are put together um, and when government put th these things into consideration, what can be done to help and support young people. Absolutely. You know, Dr. Ruma, let me bring you in there because Liz talked about the huge disruption, of course, that the pandemic was, um, especially to the creative industry where quite a few young people find work and, and their livelihoods, um, not to mention also the disruption to schooling. When you think about that being a direct link to them gaining skills, and the interruption of not being in school for months on months. You know, what are some of the other residual effects or impact that you noticed also from where you are in Nigeria? The every uh, problem comes with every problem comes with opportunities. So I think uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic comes with a lot of opportunities, especially for uh, as an awakening call for the young people to know that uh, more things are coming. We all know that through research and technology that we know that the future of technology it will take away a lot of people from their jobs. So which means uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is just like a plush of to, for young people to see that that is really, really coming. And, and for more that, in Nigeria, I remember during the COVID-19, uh, the president, our president announced the COVID-19 relief, which is there about uh, 500,000 Naira and 1 million plus in Nigeria money. But you see, one of the major problems we have is that uh, during the COVID, our government try as much as possible to support the people. But the young people we have in Nigeria, uh, they, they are not productive. Some of them, uh, they, they got the money, but they don't even know what to do with the money. Because trust me, in Nigeria, there are some places that 
they, they don't they are not even connected to the internet so they are not even aware of the government uh, government support and however in this case i relied this issue to the uh, civil society organization as NGOs. I mean, the local actors who are within the community to empower those people. Because really, during the pandemic, our government tried. Let me say, out of 100% majority of the young people, uh, maybe 70 to 80% have received that grant. But some of them, they end up using the money for their personal activities because they are not being empowered. So in this case, uh, I think it is our responsibility, uh, the, the civil society organization, startup companies, to see to look at a way that we can help to empower those people, especially those within the rural communities. You, you talked about um, actors, stakeholders like civil society, um, startups, and that's the perfect segue into my next question. So we know what government has done, especially during the pandemic in terms of the subsidies and some of the social protection uh, programs they put in place to shield many of the citizens from the effects of the pandemic. But let's talk about some of the existing ones and, and probably how those could be strengthened further. We do know that governments in Africa have been trying to respond to the skills gap with the youth, um, particularly through institutions like TVET programs. That's the technical and vocational education and training programs and institutions. And, and those often times are the ones that help to at least bring out skills in more practical uh, careers, if I would say, plumbing, electricians, and whatnot. Uh, and, and what role would you say that plays in filling the gap in some of those, um, you know, some of those jobs? And, and, you know, that's a gap that's really, really needed for a developing economy um, that you see in Africa. So Liz, let me come to you because you find there is a stigma around some of those jobs. Okay. And in, in some economies, they are called blue collar jobs. Young people don't necessarily want to get involved with some of those, even though you can earn quite a good living from it. How do we begin to destigmatize those professions so they can see the value in that? And, you know, I guess the question is, is a job really a job? And, and can they really find dignity in that? Let me hand over to you, Liz. Yes, absolutely, Vicky. It's about us changing the narrative, particularly what we see in the media or what is consumed in the media. And more importantly, us changing the education model, particularly in Africa, right? Um, our education model is, is like, if I speak for Kenya, it's one that we are often told you need to work hard, study hard, make sure you become number one, two, three, make sure you get good grades. At the end of it all, you will get a good job. So you spend about 18 years working really hard, getting good grades. And then when you're done with university and high school, at about 21, 23, 25, you're told, okay, now create your own employment, become an entrepreneur, um, get into plumbing, get into landscaping, get it. It's impossible because you've not been equipped or nurtured from a young age with those skills to be able to carry out that work. When, and it's so interesting, I'm fortunate enough to have traveled um, because of my work and some of these jobs that in, in Kenya in particular, we look down upon like plumbing, landscaping, are some of the coveted jobs um, out there in Europe. Because for you to go to a mechanic, a lot of people have had to do DIY because it's too expensive to go to a mechanic, for instance, in Europe. So I think it's for us to change the narrative, what is consumed. Number two, the education model needs to really meet what the market is looking at. But in as much as I say that, it wasn't all doom and gloom because I like looking at the glass half full instead of half empty. Um, the pandemic also saw a lot of like what Dr. Ruma is mentioning. A lot of people saw challenges and they thought of opportunities. And part of those opportunities were innovation and innovation cannot be only singled out or limited to technology. There's a lot of innovation that happens beyond technology. An example is in Ghana, for instance, where two brothers um, called uh, Richard and Jared came up with this um, solar powered hand washing um, 
you know, contraption that ensured that it is timed to, that you have to clean your hands for 20 seconds as WHO guidelines, you know, such thinking out of the box, like what can I do with the challenges that are presented at the moment? I mean, we saw um, the very famous Kabila, Kabi, I hope I'm pronouncing his name properly, the most followed human being on earth, um, who was a factory worker and because of the pandemic became redundant. And what did he do? He decided, you know what, I don't even have to speak. Let me just share what I'm feeling. And this is the power of, you know, social media platforms. Um, not even going too far. Elsa Majimbo, look at where she is right now, you know. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity in terms of thinking broadly, not just books are really critical. They're very important. They lay the foundation. But I think it's really important for our education models in Africa to really align with the market needs at the moment. Um, through a Mob Ibrahim survey, you know, and report, we churn out about 30 million uh, young people annually in the labor market. Who's gonna hire 30 million people annually? Yeah, for jobs that are not there. How can we start nurturing things like um, AI, artificial intelligence, um, coding from, you know, the age of six, the age of three? How can we start teaching kids how to do plumbing, um, to become mechanics, ETC, from a very young age. And it's something that they can grow up. To. Who knows? When you start as a mechanic, you can own your own airplane manufacturing industry, you know? You know, it's, it's really interesting, Liz, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the issue of the market alignment. You know, oftentimes is that skills mismatch. So you'll have a, a young person who went through four years of university and they expect that I will be working in this field because I have this piece of paper. And, and the reality is you may not. And, and there might be a need to innovate and also transfer those skills to a completely different sector. Dr. Ruma, how do you start to advise a young person like that? They may not be as big as Elsa Majimbo and Kabi on social media in terms of being innovative, but what do you tell them practically? You see, what to me, what I describe about creativity and talent is what you can make. And we both know that in Africa, we go to school and then we get a certificate. You see, this is one of the reasons why I'm always calling, I'm advocating for Nigerian government to combat our university vocational skill centers. Because at the trending moment, we both know that skills matters a lot. However, or else we can uh, maybe rechange our curriculums in the university because you can go to one of the universities in Nigeria and find out they're using the same curriculum for more than 25 years ago. So the time, you know, things change and we have to change with them and most of the time. So with the available of social media and internet, today we see that many people have achieved a lot in terms of our skills development. That means on our own, despite of that, we personally believe that uh, having a degree certificate is good as well. But, um, you know, having a skill is even more important. That means while you're in school, you can even still uh, for sure to learn about skills, like uh, what Liz says about the, the plumbing, you know, all this kind of thing is something that will, will make you money. So you can have your own degree and then you can you can learn more skills from people, even online. I mentioned later that yesterday that, you know, uh, that through online, so that you can learn and become yourself independent. And as she said, that through the more foundations of it, that there's over 1 billion young people. This is actually something that we must know that Africa is grooming. And most of those people that have come in in Africa, they are young people, which means nobody should tell us that there is no job. For instance, in, in, in Nigeria, in every university, in each state, in each state of the country, in so we we have, how many states do we have? Which means how many universities? Okay, we seem to have lost Dr. Ruma briefly, but Liz, let yeah. me bring you in here on a question that you kind of hear from every young person, not just in Africa, but across the globe when it comes to experience. You know, you're coming for an entry level position and you're told, uh, yeah, you can get the job, but you need experience. And they're thinking, where do I actually start and begin to get this experience? How do they begin to put themselves in situations where they get that exposure uh, before the employment comes into play? Thank you for that question, Vicky. Apprenticeship and mentorship. Yes, have. I'm really big on mentorship and apprenticeship, which doesn't happen enough in the African context. And it, it's quite unfortunate because, and, and this is about the two different generations, the young people 
and the people who've been there, the giants that I always call who've been there before us. It's about having that exchange of skills and knowledge. So um, it's quite surprising to me that, you know, in 2009 in Kenya, for instance, we, in the public service, um, the retirement age was pushed from 55 years to 60 years of age. Why? Because they felt there would be a lacuna left or a vacuum left because there wasn't enough young people within the public sector to take up some roles. Recently, there is a bill called the Getriatic, sorry, I need to get the name right, Geriatric Bill 2021, which really is about calling back people from specific special sectors like education, health, um, back, back into the public sector beyond the retirement age because they feel that there's still that skills gap. Now, this is the funny thing. I live in a country where the mean age is 20.1 years old. Everybody, um, the largest number, the public sector that you know employs a lot of people, we have people who are over 50 years old. So how can we have mentorships, apprenticeships? How can we ensure every civil service, every public sector unit has a, a number of young people that are linked from the public universities to really learn how do we make government more appealing to people? I have worked in a state corporation and it is nothing like the narrative that is out there that it is um, you know, people who don't do their jobs, who come to work at 10, p 10 a.m., leave at 3 p.m. It is nothing like that. I, as far as my experience is concerned, I have seen people pulling hours, really successful stories, but the government is not really able to articulate and tell these stories or package them in an appealing way to young people. I think the Ministry of um, ICT has really been trying through the program called AJIRA, We've seen a lot of partnerships with MasterCard Foundation in their program called Afri um, Africa Works, Young Africa Works. We've seen more and more private sector, the development sector and government come together to find a solution um, in how they can get young people into these various positions. So I think for experience, I challenge young people out there, don't just sit on your you know, don't just sit and think, you know, after I finish this doctorate or after I finish this degree, there is a job waiting for me. I'll use myself as an example. I started working since I was 17 years old. When I started, um, you know, when I was in doing my low graduate um, studies from first year, I started working and it meant pulling in the hours you have to study. So by the time you are actually done, you know, when you take up these roles, um, by the time you're done with your fourth year, you have three years of experience, you know? So it's, it's also how to circumvent and come up with clever ways of gaining that experience. When you're on holiday, how can you contribute? How can you volunteer? Volunteer is another thing that a lot of young people don't like to do, but you have to do it um, to counter the whole um, issue of experience. That for me is my perspective. It has to be a two-way thing. There has to be proactivity from the young people to seek out these mentorships. Um, it is the role of the public, private, and development sectors to give these apprenticeships and mentorships. And it's also the role of everybody who's concerned to ensure that there's an enabling environment to support that, particularly government. No, certainly. And as we, we wait for Dr. Ruma to reconnect with us, um, I, I just have a follow-up question to that. So uh, fantastic suggestions there from you, Liz, in terms of the kinds of experience that young people can get pre-employment. Um, but I wonder, the, the obsession that not just young people, but any working person has to work for a big brand because it looks fantastic on your CV, uh, you know, how else can you encourage them to look at other opportunities with other companies that can give them the same experience uh, that can look fantastic on their resumes? What would you uh, advise them on that? I would just say hashtag self-made. Look at Omanyala, for instance, right? If we invest even in the arts and culture, right, and sports, 
I mean, sports has really huge untapped potential. Again, I go back to Rwanda because it's such a model country in terms of the utilities, in terms of the investments that have been put in to support young people. Um, one of the biggest characteristics of, you will notice that lots of young, tall people in Rwanda, what did president do? Set up one of the best, you know, centers, basketball centers in, within the country, right? And you can see it's, it's bearing fruit. We have seen investors coming in. We have seen people from the NBA come scout talent from there. I mean, in Kenya, for instance, what can we borrow? We are very good at running, right? Just the other day, who would have thought we are very good at tennis? So there's a lot of untapped potential within the sports sector that really needs to be leveraged. Um, and this goes beyond just, you know, school, school, school. And these people like Omanyala, he's a self-made brand, right? So we don't have, we need to move away from these big brands. Because when we look at, let me use an, an example of Google, Microsoft, Apple, they were all founded by a person. It's not a group of people, of 20 people who came together and decided, let's form this. Yeah, it's, it was an idea that was born by one person that has had multiplier effects. It's like a snowball, right? That has gone giving and giving and become bigger and better and evolving. How can we do that? How can we adapt and appreciate and acknowledge that? By, by also acknowledging that we are always in a constant state of becoming, right? I always encourage young people to, yes, you have your PhD, you have your degree, you have your two master's degree, but how do you continue building skills that resonate with what the market wants? And my encouragement is look at the trending, the future of work. Honestly, there's some roles that were back in the day that are obsolete right now. How can you sit down with your mentors and Think of your trajectory. Think of your journey. What are some of the things that our market needs? Yeah, we need for cybersecurity people, um, Internet of Things. Uh, we need more sportsmen and sportswomen out there in the diverse different pools of um, sporting activities. In arts and culture, I'll give you an example again from Rwanda because I was just there just last week. Um, there's this beautiful art center called Ineme Art Center um, and Choose Kigali. This is a group of five brothers who came together and because they've had this passion for art, um, they just invested and continued. And it's all about resilience and consistency. Right now, I was looking at one painting at $38,000 and I was like, my goodness, you know, at the, you know, when you put in the work at the end, it will pay up, it will pay off. No, certainly, Liz. I mean, and those are, are fantastic insights. I feel young people certainly will benefit from. I can see a comment here from Stephen Gishohi. He says it's vital to link skills development and the specific country region, high potential economic growth sectors to avert a skills mismatch. This would ensure that the workforce we build is absorbed in the market, so certainly. Um, and, and let's talk more about the creative industry and, and how a company, for instance, like Canon comes into play. Um, we talked about Kabi, we talked about Elsa Majimbo. These are people who are content creators and would rely heavily on the technology and devices that Canon produces and getting their faces and work out there. But, you know, what other avenues can young people start to leverage on when it comes to that content creation space? Because it's huge and they see how much in terms of endorsements and partnerships that these young people are getting into as a result of them, like you're saying, building the self-made brands. Um, that's a very good question, Vicky. I think the biggest challenge sometimes with us young people is the, you know, comparison. Comparison is a thief of all joy. Um, I assume that if I get into content creation today, I'm going to become bigger and blow up like Elsa or blow up like um, Kabe. Um, I think we need to appreciate your target audience. Um, and, and some of them just happened organically, right? Um, but it doesn't have to be just content creation and dependent on the internet. Um, there's also, last year, I got the opportunity to be a jury member of the Africa um, Young Innovators Health Awards. And this was um, um, a, a, 
an award for different young people across the continent that were submitting ideas on the work that they've been doing that doesn't even have to be tech related, but is solving health, topical health issues within their countries. There were three winners. There was one from Kenya. Uh, I mean, one was from Cameroon, one from Kenya. The other one was from Nigeria. And the one from Nigeria, um, he was working on something to do with metaverse and AI and you know, using artificial intelligence to adapt medical records, because we all know how difficult it is sometimes in the rural setting to get medical records. And for that third price, he got $15,000 to scale up. Um, the top winner from Cameroon, Tokonu, um, he came up with the idea of um, contraption that can be used to access uh, breast um, diagnosis, breast cancer, and uh, um, it was breast cancer diagnosis in rural areas because they were not getting the cancer treatments or testing or diagnosis. And he got $40,000 to scale up his business, right? So there are opportunities there. You need to look at what problem are you solving? Yeah, and it doesn't have to be just limited to tech. Absolutely. And, but you know, you're talking about the future of work and, and I really want to bring in Dr. Ruma in here because this is an area that he's very passionate about. That's digital skills. And I was coming, I came across a IFC report um, that said 230 million jobs in Africa will require some level of digital skills. So if you're not playing the tech space now or in the years to come, you will be severely left out um, of any economic growth. You know, Dr. Ruma, how do you begin to, to close that gap? And I know you've been really involved in that. Yeah, no, you see, I have been saying that many times that we both know that the technology is like a revolution and the revolution is coming to Africa, particularly now. And many people understand that. But our major issue or our major problem that is people from the unserved communities, those people, they have no access to the Internet and they have no access to uh, uh, even, even, even a smartphone. They don't even have a smartphone. So if the revolution has been adopted or it has been in Africa almost everywhere, how can those young people can get access? That is a major problem. So in this case, I'm always saying that it's a collective responsibility for all of us to see that how we can ship those young people in. It is not government responsibility alone because this government is busy with a lot of things, which means we, as a people who sees the picture about the technology, who have passion for the technology, then we have to get involved by providing a free training to those young people, getting access to them on the, the South community. System. And maybe we, we by partnership with the NGO, local NGOs in the community, providing a free digital space training for them. You see, one of the biggest companies I've seen in the world trying to do that is the Gogo. Gogo provided a, uh, a free digital space for Africans, which I'm part of the people that implemented the programs, especially in Nigeria. What we did was uh, we provided a free training to those on the South community, to the rural communities, to, to have at least even a a knowledge of, uh, uh, of digital skills, you see, that will help them in future when this digitalization issue we're talking about will come to them, which means we need to keep motivating those young people in the rural communities to know that something big is coming and it's, it's just like a moving train and everybody needs to be part of that train. Then they need to support themselves by coming up into the programs. And because one of the major challenges we are facing in Africa is if you are providing a program, those of us who have an NGO, uh, may, 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 may know what I'm talking about. You can have an NGO providing a free services, nobody will come. That is absolutely discouraging, you know that. Huh? But with time, if you have passion for those people, with just a time that you need to uh, keep motivating them to know that the, the reality is that that thing you are advocating for the digital skills is, is like a moving train. And if you left behind, you have left behind already. So I think it's a responsibility for even the government, maybe for an, an advocacy and maybe to uh, to have a small resources for people to go into that local communities and even in the cities to advocate for the digital technologies. Absolutely. And I want to keep you on that note, uh, Dr. Ruma, just in terms of, and it, I want to go a bit controversial. Okay. You know, when you talk about digital skills, when you're talking about the future being a gig economy, 
skills mm. is going to be the route that many young people are kind of put on. And the reason I say that is because when you look at a career like computer programming, it can be, you know, a, a dual path. One person can go the conventional way, study for the mm. four years, get their degree. Another individual can do a few months of training and get more or less the same skill set and get a job in fewer than the four years that their counterpart did in university. And so the question is, um, a piece of paper versus the skills you'll get to land the job. And think about that in the African context where a piece of paper is paramount to get your foot in the door in terms of employment. But what, what do you say to that debate? Uh, you see, there is one thing I always said. I always say skills, not degrees. In fact, that is, I presented paper most, I think, around three times that skills, not degrees. But one of the questions that all of the participants ask me is that, but you have a three degrees. So how can you say skills, not degrees, actually? But you see, it's just, I use the word skills, not degrees, just as, uh, as a direct fact for people to understand that something big is, we're talking about something big here, because I'm just like creating a debate. Um, and on that more, I want you to know that we both know, everybody knows that, that in today's world, skills matters a lot more than degrees. We both know, we agree on that. But a lot of people, even me myself, recently I understand that that certificate you have for the degree is like a one-step ladder for your success in life. Because if you really want to work for the company, for anyone, you need to have that qualification. That will help a lot. But that qualification alone, uh, alone will not help you in the present economy in Africa today. Because we both know that that skills is what really matter the most in, in every society. That's why in Nigeria, I'm always calling for the government to combat our university, as I said earlier, to the vocational skill centers. Even if they didn't do that, fine. But I want them to introduce one of, uh, to, to edit their curriculum to uh, implement the skills programs in the final year students so that they will go with both two certificates. Well, they go with three certificates, actually, the skills of self, the skills certificate, and even the degree. So in today, Africa, we know that having the certificate is not enough. You need that skills. So the skills and the certificate, they are both important. And you have to work to get the both of them. Uh, Liz, I, I wonder which school of thought are you on when it comes to that debate? I, I, uh, well, I'm from the school of thought of, I don't think it's either or. I think they're both equally very important. And I look at a degree in this way. If I know Vicky is a brilliant moderator and there's something happening in the Oscars and I have an Oscar contact, right? And I make the introduction, right? Mm. The, the degree part is the fact that you have been practicing this. It, you, you have some level of foundation on this. The rest is on the skills part is for you to make your case, right? Um, so for me, it's not either or. I feel the two complement each other. I don't think, you know, for some careers to be medicine, law, engineering, you need the papers, whether you like it or not, right? But I think mm. it's about how do the two complement each other, depending on where you want your career trajectory to be. And that goes back mm. to the initial point I made on, you know, the education models in different countries, uh, uh, the education models need to be really reviewed. And Dr. Ruma alluded to it. You know, some of the curriculums that exist were there 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Times have changed. Professions have changed and evolved. How can we make sure there's that alignment? So for me, it, they, they complement each other because one sort of makes the foundation. The other is you know, the skills that you can actually do the job. Absolutely. You know, um, and we've talked about different players that would help in creating this enabling environment for young people to gain the skills, to be employed, and, you know, at the end of the day, to be successful. There's an interesting comment here from Elizabeth. Uh, she says, digital and digi digitally enabled jobs require skills and accelerated inclusive connectivity. The youth ecosystem should work together to ensure supply and demand are in sync. And I want to bring another player that we haven't quite talked about when it comes to employing young people and skilling them, and that's SMEs. You know, they are the biggest employers on, Af on the African continent. And, and how do they begin to engage young people in offering the skills and opportunities 
uh, many times they're not as capacitated fund wise to give them the money required, but they can give that experience. So how would you advise players like SMEs to start positioning themselves to absorb many of these young people who could elevate the work that they're doing? Um, let me begin with you, Dr. Ruma, then I'll come to you, Liz. Okay. Uh, you see, one of the things I've always said that is that in Africa, in Africa, or let me, yes, in Africa, no one is, no, everybody, most likely every young person have a skills, have a talent. It's just that they don't know how to utilize that talent. So if, you see, there's one organization I know in the U.S., what they normally do is that they get a people, they hire people from Nigeria to work for them. They just come to Nigeria, look for the skills people and take them there, show them this is what, they will ask you, what skills do you have? You'll just say, I have skills on that. And then they can give you more and more training on that skills. So actually, what I'm saying is that uh, uh, young people in Africa, we have as much as young people in Africa, you both know that. That means we have to prefer them. We have to uh, uh, give them more and more training and then tell them that this is something that you can do it. So I think uh, if we motivate them and encourage them, they can get involved. Certainly, Liz, uh, what's your take on that just in how SMEs can engage? Absolutely. One of the key components of um, SMEs and um, the entrepreneurial ecosystem is networking. I'm really glad you asked this question because it really forms part of the reason I formed the Liz and Tonjira Network and also what inspired my book because there's not enough networking opportunities or mentorship or even teaching that happens. So one of the things we do at the network is because it's a coaching, training and mentorship platform, we actually link different um, young people from various industries with industry thought leaders in that industry. Because sometimes young people are not even looking for the capital, though it's something mm. that's key for them. They're actually looking for exchange of knowledge. I want to hear what you did. Where were the biggest pain points? I'm in the same industry. What can you advise me? What do I do to avoid big losses? How can I make sure I'm not running into huge overheads? That's what young people want to hear. They're not enough networking um, activities that happen. And I really challenge businesses like the SME community. I've seen a lot of like the OWIT, um, there's the OWIT, the FEWA, these are different women um, enterprising groups that come together for learnings and exchanges. But then you see the same people over and over. How can we ensure we integrate other young people within the same industries? Um, not feeling like, oh, if, if, you know, Liz comes into this, it's going to be competition. There's enough for everybody to go around, right? How can we ensure we are passing the baton? And, and that really formed the basis of even my book. The youngest person featured in my book is only nine years old, a social entrepreneur from Nigeria who started her own Ankara line of um, teddy bears. She's called Grace Busari. And mm. what inspired her was you know, how could she help other smaller children like herself to get into school? Now imagine if she was learning this, this big Barbie doll groups or other SMEs that come in. I mean, we, you know, we are to, when we move together, we, we cover more ground. I think networking um, in the health, in the, sorry, SME ecosystem is really a key component that a lot of young people need to leverage on and take advantage of and not attend events or these networking opportunities with, oh, I attended, but have a goal. Why am I going there? Am I going to meet somebody? Am I going to learn a key skill? Am I going to get a contact for my next business opportunity? Um, so we need to really think of the end goal in mind. I think I want to add something. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. What? Ruma. Okay, I, I want to add a point but based on what Liz says, actually. You see, uh, one of the things that we are uh, having problems in today is uh, the, the actors. I mean, all of us, you know, sometimes a young group of young people can come to the, we want to learn something from you. We want to be like you. The first thing that comes to some of us will be like, you can't be like me, you know, the, these kind of things. It will be like, it's very difficult. You see, that, that means we need to even change ourselves and meet with young people, even if it's difficult, motivate them. And networking, it's have a lot. And we need to have the mindset that we attended the programs to learn about the business, about entrepreneurship, and to even utilize it, not just to go having a certificate and come back. There's a lot of problems in that. I think we need to have a vision, first of all, for what we ever do. Thank you. 
Absolutely. You know, and, and just to kind of keep on on that same note, I know Canon runs the Miraisha program uh, here in Kenya and many other African countries, and it basically uh, gives them vocational skills. And I think so far it's reached nearly 6,000 youth. Uh, and, and many of these young people walk away with qualifications. They've gotten jobs. Others have started businesses. And I want to get to that because uh, Liz, as you know, here in Kenya, the clarion call to many youth who can't get a job is start a business. And it sounds Mm. amazing. And we do know there's affirmative action funds that are targeted at the youth to take advantage of uh, of this. But many of the youth complain that it's not enough. We need more capital. We need more support. How do they effectively start on their own? And and what needs to be done to ensure that they are set up for success? Absolutely. I think it just goes back to what Dr. Ruma talked about, like somebody getting into business and they want success the following day. Success is a slow but gradual process. Um, You will start seeing, you know, meeting your margins in two years, in three years. Give yourself an incubation period, yeah? You don't get into business and expect, oh, I'll be, you know. And and, and sometimes it's the narrative that media uh, perpetuates. Like the, you know, when we look at a lot of, rags to riches stories, um, you know, gives a lot of young people this false hope or enigma that, oh, I can start a business today and tomorrow I'm a millionaire. No, it doesn't happen like that. I think we need to hear more of the pain points of the journeys that people have gone through, the, the really challenging journeys that people have gone through. I know people who've taken 10 years to build a business um, and at year eight, they felt like giving up, but they they kept on being resilient, et cetera. And, and those are some of the stories that we need to hear more. We need people to come up with business plans and, and to know how to manage their finances, like accounting, how to file their taxes, how to you know not take shortcuts, but actually go the long haul to setting up a proper thriving business. I think it goes back again to some really key instrumental courses or lessons that young people need to know, not just for like to get a job, but to also help themselves in personal finances. Things like accounting and how to manage your finances are things that need to be in the curriculum from a very Mm. young, you know, things like how to do a business plan need to be there. I mean, we read every other day that you cannot be in the current state of cost of living and inflation, you can't just have one source of income, you know? So this, how to come up with a business plan, the basic skills of entrepreneurship need to be really taken as a life skill and not just something to make money out of. I think that's what I would say. No, certainly, you know, I came across an interesting stat from a PwC survey and they talked to young people aged between 18 to 24 years. And they found among a majority of that group believed there were no traditional employment opportunities in the future. And instead, they wanted to promote their own personal brands and sell skills on a short term basis to people who needed it, Uh, basically setting us up for that gig economy that we've been talking about a bit earlier in the conversation. You know, Dr. Ruma, I know you run a digital skills clinic in Nigeria you know, and, and tell us more about what that does and, and how young people have benefited from that initiative. Okay. I, I think I want to take us back to what, the point that you said. Some of the young people said that the capital is not okay for them. You see, one of the things I've always said that is uh, if you want to start a business, huge amount of money is not the problem, but you need a common sense. You don't need a huge capital to start business. All you need is a common sense, actually. Because that common sense is what I tell you that it's not about the money, it's about understanding the practical aspect of the business. Right? And coming back to, to your last question, is that um, you see, I, I'm seeing that there is a major problem in terms of the people, young people, to get a job in the country because there's a connection gap between the job seekers and even the job providers. And most of the people in, in unserved and underserved community, when I say that, I'm talking about the rural communities, they are graduate, but uh, they don't even know how to apply for the job. And some of them, they don't even know how to do interviews. Some of them, they don't even have a good CB, you know. Uh, some of, there's a lot of problems in that aspect. That's why we are running Digital Skills Bank 
to serve as uh, as a database for the millions of on, uh, undergraduates in the country, whereby an employer who is looking for a candidate can reach thousands and share their their jobs opportunity, and as well as for the candidate who are looking for the jobs, they can register with us and share their CV, their information. And likewise, we have a skills market. That skills market is the first of its kind skills market in the country that uh, created a jobs opportunity for artisans. As I said, that most of some of the artisans in, the, in, in, in Nigeria, that they are artisans naturally, because I've said that earlier that the young people have a skills. None of them have ever been go to school, but they are at some. So what will they do? Because some of the organizations and companies, they will say, we are not hiring uh, any individual who doesn't have a certificate. So that's why under the skill bank, we have a skills clinic as an online certification program. So we are running it as a dual mode system, whereby if you are very far from, my, from our location, you can do it online, get a certificate, and come back into the skill bank and then register with us. So that helps a lot to bridge the, the, the gap between the job seekers and job providers. And moreover, is that there's a lot of, uh, of NGOs who are looking for funding opportunities to execute a project in their communities. As well as there's a lot of uh, young people who are looking for scholarships, who are looking for fellowships, who are looking for mentors, but they don't have the, uh, a platform where to look for those people. So we also run opportunities of, as a digital uh, opportunities platform whereby uh, we, we, we created a community that connected those young people into those opportunities. And uh, we created an avenue, a live chat, uh, chat platform whereby you can contact us if you are applying and then you have a problem. So I think uh, we, need, we need more and more this kind of platform in Nigeria and as well as in Africa because there's millions of opportunity out there and there's millions of young people who are looking for the opportunity but they don't know where to get them. So if we can have a more and more platforms like mine, I think in the next 10 to 5 or 25 years, everybody in the Africa will have a job or they, they are busy and getting themselves in somewhere. I, I love that optimistic note that you finished your last point on, Dr. Ruma. But um, let's keep that because I really want you to, to kind of condense a message of hope, almost mm -hmm. a take home that a young person watching this uh, would actually want to hear and walk away with to push them forward. Um, Dr. Ruma, what would you tell them? Liz, what would you tell them? Let me start with you, Dr. Ruma, and Liz will wrap up with you. I think you need to rewind back, please. Sorry. I, I didn't hear that, the last statement. So you're, you're parting short, Sorry, a word of encouragement, a word of encouragement to a young person that they can take away from this conversation. If you can literally condense everything you've said in the conversation to a few thoughts that they can walk away with. Okay, to anyone, I think the young people watching us know that there's an opportunity there and the opportunity is waiting for you. And I want you to know that there is nobody can change you, you can only change yourself, but that means there's a lot of responsibility in yourself. Think about it, ask yourself, why did you, why God created you in this community? Then that means the community need you. You see, the young people in Africa have a skills, have a talent. All it takes is to utilize it. Utilize that talent and skills and bring even more people to that. So I want everybody watching this, the young people in Africa, to know that there is still hope. And when I say hope, I mean it because we know the hope, there is a hope in the future. So I want you to go out there and do what it takes for you to succeed. Fantastic. Well said. Uh, Liz, last word goes to you. Yes, I couldn't agree more with Dr. Ruma. And I would just say, do not be afraid to fail. Um, mm. you know, it's never failure. It's a learning lesson. And the next time you try something, you're trying it from a point of experience. I'm just going back to what Vicky was mentioning. And, you know, look at the glass half full as opposed to half empty. Be optimistic, be resilient. You know, you, it will fail once, fail second time, fail that time, but don't do it the same way because you will fail. But try different ways of doing different things. But I think the biggest challenge um, facing the youth, which is unemployment, which is the jobs or skills gap, is the solution is multifaceted and requires multi stakeholders to come up to get, to come together and come up with these solutions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Ruma, uh, Liz, for your insights. And you know, I can see quite a few reactions.
questions online as well from those following the conversation. Thank you. Keep those comments coming. Uh, it's great to be back after a short break on Africa for Tears of Innovation. We will be having these engagements once every month. So keep your eyes peeled and engaged on the Canon EMEA LinkedIn page and the Canon CNA Facebook page for more details and alerts on the next conversation and exciting topic that we'll be having coming up. I'm Victoria Rubediri, and it's an absolute pleasure and honor uh, being your moderator for today. See you on the next Africa Frontiers of Innovation conversation. Bye for now.